Listen to these two sounds and let me know which one you think is lower pitched. If you're like me and most people, you'll agree that the second sound appears to be lower pitched. However, that's actually an illusion. The first sound was a simple 100 hertz sine wave. While the second sound was a 100 hertz sine wave, a 150 hertz sine wave, and a 200 hertz sine wave. We often think of pitch and frequency as the same thing. Higher frequency, higher pitch, lower frequency, lower pitch. And this is mostly true, but there are some strange things that happen when we take into account our perception of sound and the psychological tricks we sometimes play on ourselves. This demo was inspired by a book I've been reading lately called This Is Your Brain on Music, written by Dr. Daniel J. Levitin. Dr. Levitin is a record producer turned neuroscientist and researcher, and I've really enjoyed his book so far. It's all about why we hear things the way we do as humans, and many of the things I've learned in this book have proven to be helpful for mixing and recording music. I've been listening to the audiobook narrated by the author himself, and I'll leave a link for you in the description to get the audiobook for free when you sign up for a new account with Audible. If you prefer the paperback version, you can also find that linked below for less than $10 on Amazon. Using those links supports Audio University at no additional cost to you. One of the things discussed in the book is the idea of overtones or harmonics. The basic principle is that objects in the world vibrate at several different frequencies simultaneously, and those frequencies are mathematically related. For example, if I play the note A on a guitar at 440 hertz, you won't only hear 440 hertz, but also integer multiples of that frequency, 880 hertz, 1320 hertz, 1760 hertz, and so on. To better understand this pattern, let's simplify the numbers a bit. So rather than a first harmonic or fundamental frequency of 440 hertz, we can use 100 hertz. The first harmonic is the fundamental frequency itself, 100 hertz. That will be followed by the second harmonic, 200 hertz, the third harmonic, 300 hertz, the fourth harmonic, 400 hertz, the fifth harmonic, 500 hertz, and so on. Notice that you simply add the fundamental frequency to itself again and again to calculate these overtones. This alone is a helpful concept to understand because the unique harmonic character of an instrument is one of the key factors that differentiates the same note being played on different instruments. We see and hear the same pattern of overtones from each instrument but the relative blend of those frequencies defines the unique timbre of the instrument. The same concept is also relevant for identifying different types of distortion and saturation. If you want some help understanding the frequency range of various instruments, download the free instrument frequency guide below. It will help you identify which frequencies correspond to undesirable qualities for each instrument, like muddiness or harshness, as well as potentially desirable qualities, like fullness and bite. It's a great tool for improving your ear for mixing, and you can get access to the guide for free at audiouniversityonline.com slash instrument frequency guide, or by using the link below this video. In Dr. Levitin's book, he doesn't just explain what overtones are, but actually dives into something that I found particularly intriguing, which inspired me to make this video for you. In the book, he says, the brain is so attuned to the overtone series that if we encounter a sound that has all of the components except the fundamental, the brain fills it in for us in a phenomenon called restoration of the missing fundamental. A sound composed of energy at 100 hertz, 200 hertz, 300 hertz, 400 hertz, and 500 hertz is perceived as having a pitch of 100 hertz, its fundamental frequency. But if we artificially create a sound with energy at 200 hertz, 300 hertz, 400 hertz, and 500 hertz, leaving off the fundamental, we still perceive it as having a pitch of 100 hertz. We don't perceive it as having a pitch of 200 hertz because our brain knows that a normal harmonic sound with a pitch of 200 hertz would have an overtone series of 200 hertz, 400 hertz, 600 hertz, 800 hertz, etc. This is the principle behind the illusion that I showed you just a moment ago. When you heard 100 hertz by itself, it registered in your brain as a pitch of 100 hertz. And there's no surprise there. 
The same would be true if we added in the overtones that our brain would expect from a 100 hertz tone, 200 hertz and 300 hertz. But when you heard the combination of 100 hertz, 150 hertz, and 200 hertz, your brain identified this pattern as the overtone series that follows 50 hertz. So even though the 50 hertz fundamental wasn't actually played, your brain perceived it because it recognized the pattern and filled in the blank. By the way, if you find this sort of thing interesting and you love learning about audio, you should put your current knowledge to the test by taking the free audio university exam. It's just a fun way to test your audio knowledge and learn in the process. You can take the test for free at audiouniversityonline.com slash exam. Dr. Levitin goes on to talk about how the firing rate of neurons in the brain are the same as the frequency that is perceived by the auditory system. When you hear a 100 hertz tone, your auditory neurons fire 100 times per second. Then he described an experiment by Peter Janata. The researchers played a version of Strauss's The Blue Danube Waltz that was made up of tones with the fundamental frequency removed. Then they played that piece of music for a barn owl. And this is where it gets really crazy. The researchers had connected electrodes to the owl's inferior colliculus, part of its auditory system and they fed those signals to an amplifier and speaker. When the music played, the owl heard it, and the electrodes connected to its brain put out small electrical signals. Those electrical signals, when amplified, played the melody of the Blue Danube Waltz through the speaker. I don't know about you, but I found this to be mind-blowing. And if you also like this sort of thing, check out this book that I've linked below, as this is just from the first chapter. But what does all of this actually tell us about mixing? Well, for one, I think it helps to demonstrate that our brains don't actually need to hear a frequency in the mix if other context is provided through overtones within the mix. This is something I originally learned from Paul Willie Green Womack, an educator, producer, and mixing engineer during a presentation he gave at the AES convention a few years ago. We mix music on full range speakers, which can reproduce a wide range of frequencies. But what happens when that song you've mixed on studio monitors is played back through smartphone speakers? The speakers in a smartphone are tiny and can't produce low frequency sounds. So if you have a low frequency kick or bass element in the mix, there's a chance that a smartphone listener won't hear it at all. But Paul Womack showed me a trick to counteract this problem, and it plays on the same principle we've been discussing in this video. Paul says that even though we know the fundamental frequency of let's say 50 hertz won't play through a tiny smartphone speaker, we can use saturation to create some harmonic distortion to excite overtones. And there's a chance the smartphone listener can still perceive the low frequency elements through the phenomenon we've discussed in this video, restoration of the missing fundamental. Let me show you a basic demo that illustrates this. This track has a 100 hertz tone generator on it, which will represent a low frequency element in the mix. And we can imagine that when played through studio monitors, we can hear it and see it on the RTA graph. But when the listener's smartphone speakers effectively place a high pass filter on the sound, the low frequency sound disappears, and it gets a lot quieter on this RTA graph. As an extreme example, to illustrate the concept, we could apply some saturation to the mix with this in mind. Of course, we don't want to ruin the mix with excessive saturation, we just want to use it as a tool to excite some higher frequency harmonics. When I turn up the amount knob on the saturation plugin, we see overtones arise. This will play through studio monitors along with the low frequency sound itself, but when we add the smartphone high pass filter, it allows the people listening on a smartphone to hear these overtones, even though the fundamental has been lost. And because of this, the smartphone listener's brain now has context that can help them fill in the blank in the form of an overtone series that's harmonically related to the lost fundamental. To make this more practical, imagine we have an 808 sound in a mix that's too low to be heard on a smartphone speaker. We can still hear the attack of the transients a bit because it's at a higher frequency, but the resonance gets lost. 
So saturation is a tool that can enrich that sound with higher frequency harmonics, which would allow the sound to fill in the mid-range and translate better to more playback systems. So even though the smartphone listener only hears those higher harmonics, their brains still tell them that the fundamental frequency of the 808 instrument is the original frequency that can't be heard on their speakers, but can still be perceived thanks to the saturation we've added. Don't forget to check out the show notes below where you'll find Dr. Levitin's book and also a link to the instrument frequency guide. In the next video that's on your screen now, we're taking a closer look at saturation and how it can be used in a mix. I'll see you there.